Hi, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. And this is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. Hey, Beth. Hey, Christy. <laughs> How's it going? It's going good. Yes, summer. Yay. Good. Yay. Yes, summer is here to stay. Well, you are, my kids are already done. Yours are ending this week, right? Yep. Yeah. One so. last week of solo time at the pool and not having to clean around them. Man, maybe I should have flown to you for the week. Yeah. Left my kids home with Emery. 100%. <laughs> you should come now. <laughs> Be like, get them to camp. <laughs> no. <laughs> Your oldest can take them. <laughs> oh, well, that is actually true. But anyway. But anyway, so. So yay for summer. Exciting stuff. Um, we, this is ep- Go ahead. I was just going to say that we were just doing our summer lineup, which mm-hmm. is pretty amaze balls and we have like no time <laughs> so we're gonna seem so sporadic you not to you we're gonna be on a regular schedule for y'all but mm-hmm. we are taking some time off in july and not releasing right. as many weekly episodes so you guys be ready for that if you need to prepare we're gonna do every other week in july instead of every week just so that we can have some time with our family and be lazy by a pool or whatever mm-hmm. yeah we did that last year too and it mm-hmm. i think it was fine it's it was fine. fine and we're you're gearing up for our serial killer september which really takes a lot of time and we're also doing some super special things over on patreon for september so mm-hmm. you got to come that way to find out the deets yep yeah and we have a new well. patreon Oh, right. That's right. We will give a big shout out to our new closet sister, Brittany M. Thank you so much for today. Yay, Brittany. We appreciate, we appreciate the support from all of our Patreons. Yes. So we do. Um, Other than that, I think we don't have a whole lot more to, we don't want to keep you because this episode is a long one and a doozy. (laughs) I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty awful. All of the above. I agree. Prepare yourselves and hunker down because it's gonna it's, it's gonna take a while. So sorry about that. It's a ride. All right, are you ready to go on it? I am ready. Here we go. So I need to start this out by saying this is an extreme case of child abuse. So if you do not think that you can handle it, then you need to just skip this episode. And I'm sorry to Beth who cannot skip I the episode. Just getting ready to say, I gotta go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you cannot, you cannot skip it. And I apologize to you for that. Um, and it's r- taken me, I just explained to you too, it's taken me a really long time to get to this one because it's a big case. And I mean, maybe it was big out there, but by big, I mean like, it's got a lot of meat <laughs> and it was a lot to get through. And it has a book called My Sweet Angel by John Glatt that I bought. I already hate it. I already hate it. <laughs> that already, I hate it. My okay. sweet angel? No, I am out. I have to go. Okay. Well, and then I will tell this to a wall, <laughs> the story. <laughs> um, I bought the book immediately as soon as we got the suggestion. And then I started to read it. And then I just had to skim for like random information after that, like, because I just, it's very detailed. It gives an entire account of everything. And if I had finished reading it, I think this episode would be like legitimately hours long and it would just end up being me like reading the book to you. Like it was an audio book. So I was like, I just, you know, like whoever wants to dive, do a deep dive, you can have it because we can give this book away. Okay. And y'all can try and get through it, but I just couldn't. It's not, I'm not saying it's a bad book. I just could not go through every single detail like that and be okay. So this suggestion was your niece, Alyssa. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And it's probably the only reason that I it like I was okay with taking so long to do it because I was like, she'll understand. Yeah. She'll understand. <laughs> She's family. <laughs> She's family. I wrote her yesterday. I'm like, I'm so sorry that I'm finally – like, I'm just getting to this. But I just – like, it took me so long to, like, get through. Anyway, take a deep breath. Okay. okay. This is the story of Garnet Spears. But in order to hear his story, we need to go back a little bit and go talk about his mom, Lacey Spears. Do you know that name? No. Okay. 
She was born October 16th, 1987 in Atwater, California. She was the youngest of three children um, to Terry and Tina Spears. Rebecca is her older sister, and she was born in 1984, and Daniel came 18 months after Rebecca, and then Lacey. Okay. So, Terry was an aircraft mechanic for the Air Force, and just after Lacey was born, the Air Force base that he was on shut down, and so Terry quit doing that job, and they moved to Decatur, Alabama, which is in northern Alabama, and they moved there because Tina's parents lived there. Okay. So- and they moved into um, Tina's parents' house. Oh, them. okay. Terry got a job as a welder. And according to family members, Terry and Tina weren't the healthiest people. They were young, but they weren't – like Terry had Crohn's disease and celiac disease, so he was just always just oh, uncomfortable yeah. and whatnot. And Tina had um, type 1 diabetes. Okay. okay. Type 1, I'm trying to think. Yes, type – sorry. Uh, that's a really bad one. Yeah. For, like testing. All the time. So, um, oh, and Terry was also deaf in one ear, but he was a hard worker, was trying to pr- just su- support his family and provide for them. So anyway, also Tina is described as a cold and unaffectionate mother. Not that she's like mean and abusive, but just, she's just not motherly. I'm guessing, you know, she's not like, oh, come here, which I'm not overly like that either. Oh, I'm not unaffectionate. Not no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not to that extreme. But if my kids are like, oh, I fell down. I'm like, you're fine. <laughs> like, get over it. You'll be all right. Are you bleeding from the face or anything? You're no then, BS. That's very different than being described well, as cold and unaffectionate. <laughs> okay. That's true. Fine. 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 I don't, I'm not equating myself to Tina. But anyway. So as a child, Lacey collected Beanie Babies and American Girl dolls, which we all know what those are. Uh-huh. I wasn't an American Girl doll. I didn't realize that they were that old. Yeah. I guess I was thinking it was more like the currently, which I know it's still current, but I didn't realize that they were out back. My daughter likes American Girl dolls, and Mm -hmm. she always is like, my friends' moms gave them their dolls. Why don't you have any American Girl dolls? It's like, because I was (laughs) four-wheeling. Okay. Yeah. I I didn't like dolls. I don't like dolls. Dolls creep me out. Yeah, I used to like Barbies, but not. I wasn't really that into dolls either. I used to play with cars and trucks and stuff like that. Anyway, she also loved to watch Lifetime movies. Mm-hmm. Who didn't at the time? I feel like that was like the thing to do. That's where it was like all the after school specials were, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So she had a couple of childhood friends who remember playing dolls with them or with her and how they used to just pretend they were the, the mothers of the dolls. And so they would do everything for them. And they were mothers that were hanging out and having play dates and whatnot. So they were the moms. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Except Lacey took it maybe to more of an extreme than them. Cause she really never let her dolls out of her sight and she brought them everywhere. And she didn't really like people to touch hers because one of her best friends remembered that she touched her doll once and Lacey strangled her. Um, sorry? Yeah. And then her mom wouldn't let her go over to Lacey's house anymore. I don't think I would either. So, Okay. Anyway. Okay, Lacey. Yeah. See, we can already see there's some issues with Lacey right oh, now. Oh, no. In fifth grade, her grandfather passes away and her grandmother decides to move to Clearwater. And this kind of affected Lacey because she felt really close to them, at least one or the other. And so the fact that one died and the other moved, like now she's got neither one of them because she had somewhat of a um, struggling relationship with her parents, I guess we should say. Okay. In middle school, another friend, Jessica, remembers that she and Lacey still loved playing with dolls. On her 12th birthday, she recalls Lacey being like, okay, it's time to stop playing dolls and we need to grow up now. Like, for some reason, all of a sudden, she was just like, nope, done. All right. Okay. Then she remembers one night Lacey coming over to her house and she was really upset and she wanted to talk to her mother, Jessica's mother. So Jessica's mom sat and talked to her and she told her mom that she had been abused by a relative and that she was afraid to go home. So her mom, Jessica's mom, immediately reported this to the Alabama Department of Human Resources, but there doesn't seem to be any record of an investigation. So she says she called, but when people have looked into this, like, since, doesn't appear to be any proof of anything. Okay. Does it say what kind of abuse, or do you not want to talk about that? 
Um, and that's kind of like vague, but she <clears throat> does say sexually abused. Okay. Um, but then she also says that she was physically abused. Like, so I, what she's talking about now, I don't know. But she, in general, talks about being sexually and physically abused. Got it. Okay. Lacey would complain to her other friends, to other friends and neighbors, saying that she's also being physically abused by her parents as well and would often go over to their houses as like a safe haven. So neighbors kind of thought that there was something going on, but they didn't really know. Nobody really ap- reported anything because they never saw anything. They just always heard Lacey talking about it. Mm. Her sister has maintained that she doesn't believe any of this happened. She doesn't know why Lacey would say any of this. She's like, I remember us having a happy childhood, and so I, there's no reason for her to be saying any of this that happened. Lacey ends up living with Jessica's family for a few weeks, and she even started calling Jessica's mom, mom, mm-hmm. which seems to me maybe this is like, having an unaffectionate mother and it's like her way of reaching out and like grasping for that like motherly attention. Sure. In a way. Okay. So when she's 14, she joins a church softball team where she meets Paula Sandlin, who at the time is 47. In my head, when I first was reading this, I was thinking, oh, she's a coach, blah, blah, blah. But it actually doesn't state that. And I think that it's probably because it's a uh, uh, church team. Like it's not a kid's team. It's a church league. Okay. And so anybody is – so it's like they were teammates is what I'm getting okay. as an impression right now. Like anybody who's a member of the church could be on the team. And so she joined this church team. So this woman ends up <clears throat> driving her to and from practices and like games and stuff like that in the end. And then Lacey starts calling her mom within a few weeks, which actually makes Paula feel uncomfortable. She's like, I'm not your mom and you have a mom and so you probably shouldn't be calling me that. <laughs> Just Paula. Just Paula. Right. Just call me Paula. It's fine. P, anything. <laughs> just S, anything but mom. So Paula also starts to get a little bit confused at all the stories that Lacey seems to tell people. She remembers her coming to church one day with an ankle brace saying that she had fallen while cheerleading and like sprained her ankle or whatever. And then she changes her story and talks about being that how, about how she's anorexic and being so weak because she hasn't eaten that she collapsed in the street and that's how she hurt her ankle. So it was like there was more than one reason why her she hurt her ankle. And then she talks about how she didn't eat for three days, but then somebody was like, but I saw you yesterday and you're eating a hot dog. <laughs> oh and so gosh. Lacey was like, oh yeah, that's true, but that's all I've eaten in three days. <laughs> Except for that. <laughs> for the hot dog. That's right. Forgot about the hot dog. So clearly Lacey has a little bit of trouble with the truth uh-huh. as well. Mm-hmm. So in 2002, she told everyone she was pregnant. Paula, mom, Miss P, Miss Sandlin, whatever you want to call her, doesn't believe her. And a few days later, she comes and says she's had an abortion. And she said that she had it at – and they named the medical clinic, but I didn't feel the need to like name specific – if I told you all of the clinics that she talks about in this story, we'd be super confused. So she oh. went to a specific medical clinic and somebody was like, um, but that clinic doesn't perform abortions. And so she's like, oh, well, oh, right. I went to Florida. And I had it done. <laughs> My goodness. Not a you very gotta, good liar. Yeah, You can't go from like, I went to this clinic here where we live to, oh, that's, oh, that's right. I forgot I was in Florida. Yeah. Slip my mind. That and the hot dog. Yeah, exactly. So she clearly likes to tell stories and get reactions for people and get the attention by telling the story, but she's not very good at keeping them straight from one person to the next or just in general, like getting a cohesive story together. Okay. So Lacey loves kids as referenced earlier with loving to play with dolls and stuff like that. And all she wants to do is be a mom. Hmm. Everyone, everyone knows this. She talks about it constantly, like cannot wait. Some girl in high school got pregnant and she started bringing like baby clothes in and she's like, this is what my kid's going to wear and blah, blah, blah. Like she already had – Whoa, okay. Lacey worked in the church nursery and one of the moms remembers Lacey taking a interest in her one-year-old son to the point where she started to feel uncomfortable with Lacey being like the one who took care of him. And so after a little bit, she was like – I don't want Lacey taking care of him anymore. So please don't. So I don't know what there wasn't specifics, but she just remembers it made her feel uncomfortable with how much she was like obsessed with her son. Okay. 
She also has a job at a burger place, which I guess her mom and sister and brother or somebody like had worked too. And there she makes friends with another single mom named Autumn. Autumn describes Lacey as a hard worker and the person you would go to if you needed help. If you needed someone to cover your shift, you needed a ride to work, like you ask Lacey and she's there and she'll do it for you. No problem. After high school, Lacey decides to move out of her house and moves in with her sister, Rebecca. And in order to help pay rent, she needs to get a different job. So she leaves her burger place job and works, gets a job at a daycare. Now, Rebecca also works at a daycare, but different daycares. Okay. So they don't work together. Not that that matters at all, but anyways, and she's a model employee. Like people talk about how great she is with the kids and she can take care of like five kids at a time on her own. And, you know, and she's still like, she's young, she's 18, she's graduated high school. So it's not like, you know, she's had super a lot of experience with kids other than working in the church daycare, but she does, she's really good at her job. And she also decided to start nursing school. So she's going to school to become a nurse. So it's, you know, a little added, Oh, okay. Healthcare field, whatever. So everybody feels, and she's busy. So she's super busy between work and school. She's busy, but she did find time to go out on a couple of dates with a nice police officer named Blake. Rebecca remembers Blake. This is Lacey's sister. Remembers how he was such a super nice guy, took care of her, but said that all of a sudden it was like a few dates, and then all of a sudden there was no, Blake was nowhere to be found, and she never found out why. She didn't know why they broke up. Blake says that things were going well, and that they had gone on a few dates, and all of a sudden Lacey just went off on him and didn't want to see him anymore, and he has no idea why either. He's just like, oh, she just got mad, and it's she, he touched her doll. Well, it's possible. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just messing. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either. But the only reason I mentioned Blake, because I know it was just a couple of dates, is he's relevant later in the story. Okay. And so if you're wondering why that was even important to say, there is a reason. We'll circle back to Blake. Okay. So in nursing school, she runs into an old class- classmate from elementary school named Christy. Oh. Not me. I hope she doesn't get murdered because all your stories with Christy's get murdered. <laughs> she does not. Good. Christy has a 10-month-old named Cameron. Christy's mother didn't approve of the baby's father, so she would sneak out to meet up with him, and Lacey would offer to watch Cameron anytime that she wanted to do this. And she would even say, take my car. You want to go see him? Go take my car. Go have fun. I'll take Cameron. Lacey even gets a crib in her place. She provides diapers, wipes, formula for him, like all this stuff. She'd spend as much time as she could with him. And when they were in public, she pretended that he was her son. Huh. Christy was out one day with Cameron and someone walks up to her and is like, oh, are you babysitting Lacey's son? <laughs> she was like, yeah, no, he's my son. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. So she was like, okay, that's kind of weird. Yeah. No, that's super weird. Yeah. But, I'll, you know, I, I, I'm not at all defending it, but it's like if everybody always sees her because she's constantly babysitting him, then like even if she didn't say he's my son, they might assume. Well, true. That he's hers. But anyway, she was definitely saying it though. So anyway, one weekend, Lacey, uh, L- Lacey. Lacey offered to keep Cameron for the weekend, and she took off, and Christy had no idea where she went. I don't know how what? this transpired, like in what what universe somebody would say, can I take your son for the weekend? And you're just like, here you go, and then you don't know where they go. I don't know how this happens, but I, and I'm totally not blaming Christy, but I wish I knew how specifically, but there aren't like – specifics given for this story. All I know is that Lacey took off. Chrissy couldn't find her. She wouldn't t- call her back, whatever. And when she finally got in touch with her, she was like, you need to bring him back here now. Like, 100%. No questions asked, like bring him back. And when she got back, Lacey basically broke down into tears, like begging Chrissy, please don't take Cameron away from me. Blah, 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 you know. So I can kind of see with this, why this mother was uncomfortable with her watching if she was getting obsessed with her son. Right. What she might be putting out there. So soon after this, Lacey started watching another little boy. Boy, Do you remember Autumn back from the burger shop? Okay. Yes. She now has a six month. So she had a daughter, but now she has a six month old as well. And she's struggling. So Lacey's like, well, I can, I can watch them and you can get the family discount at the daycare. So just bring them by and, I'll bring him to work with me and whatnot. Don't worry about it. So she would take him to work and often stay after the center closed and just be watching Jonathan. 
She would keep him overnight when Anna would want to stay with her boyfriend. And Lacey started calling him John John. That was her little nickname for him. And just spend tons of time with him. And I'm sure Autumn, being a single mom, is like, sweet, I've got a friend who's like totally willing to watch my kid all the right. time and I can go and do things. That's awesome. So, you know, I'd, pro- I'd probably be the same way. Her love of children was just turning into an obsession, though, as you can see. Over the course of two years, Lacey would post – this is how much she was watching Autumn – or John John – pictures of John John on her MySpace page. Oh, MySpace. <laughs> Had to get close to the mic for that one. <laughs> Posting pictures claiming he was hers. Like – um. Captions like, oh, look how wonderful my son is. He's the apple of my eye. He's her joy. I mean, in this book, there's like nonstop captions that she put on her like social media pages for pictures that she's posting of kids that were not her kids. Wow, that is creepy. Yeah, a little bit. And Autumn had no idea. Maybe Autumn wasn't on social media or just didn't care, like, or didn't, she had no idea. She found out a long time later that she was doing this online. She portrayed him as her child for years online and in person. She ran into an old classmate and told her that he was hers. When the classmate asked questions about him, she was like, oh, well, he's not really mine. He's my sister's kid. But the person knew Rebecca and was like, I know Rebecca doesn't have any kids. So so basically everybody was like, can we even trust her? Because I feel like we are always catching her in some sort of lie. And then she changes the story to something else ridiculous. So this friend's suspicious. During this time, Lacey was watching that she was watching John John. He would have at least 12 ear infections and got a hole in his eardrum. Oh, no. Yeah. No doctors ever raised a suspicion about it. But always when Lacey was not with John John, the infections would go away or wouldn't happen. And then when she would have him again, they would come back again. So, but nobody was really putting that together until. A long time after, but that was the pattern. She would have him. He'd have ear infections. He'd be back home, and they'd get better. Pretty strange, don't you think? Yeah, but ear infections, though, like you're so. Gonna... Go ahead. I was going to say you're going to tell me. I'm assuming. Well, I, so I don't know. I've been trying to search. The... <laughs> I was just talking to Emery last night about my search history. <laughs> it's like it's ridiculous i'm like how to cause an ear infection oh my gosh that's so true maybe my google won't work today because it's like (laughs) she's trying to abuse her children we need to take her access to the internet away because all that would come up is causes of ear infections i could not find a way to find if you could actually cause an ear infection to happen um but, I, but it might not have been an infection. He constantly had pus in his ear. So something was infected, but it might, it's probably not like a true ear infection. Like, cause that's only caused by like bacteria and whatnot, like right. viral infections. But he was, he had some sort of infection in his ears and pus. Literally they would just be filled with pus. Oh my gosh. That sounds awful. Yes, it does. But I don't, I have no clue. I have not, if I ever figure it out, if Google allows me to search anymore, <laughs> I, I will get back gosh, to okay. Google. I don't <laughs> You can't take Google away from us. <laughs> oh, well, it just shuts down on my phone today. So, anyways, okay. So, during the time that she has John John in her life, she also meets Shauna, another parent who started bringing her children to the daycare that Lacey was working at. She brought her two children, Mick Kelly and Zach. Lacey grew attached to Mick Kelly. It's a, it's a very hard word to say, a name to say for me M C K E L L Y, Mick okay. Kelly. And then all of a sudden, Lou, Lacey's like, can I take him home? <laughs> and Shauna was, didn't think anything of it because she had John John thinking John John was hers and was like, oh, sure. You want to like have a play date? Okay. Yeah. You can take McKelly home. So she lets him take him home, which again, it's very strange to me. I don't know that I would do that. Uh-oh. <laughs> right? Even if you have this wonderfully nice daycare person, I like, I don't know. It would be strange to me. But again, I'm not judging. Just I feel like I would not do that. So Shauna lets her take him home. She went to her house, saw all the toys, things that she had for John John and was impressed. It was like she had her own like daycare facility there. Like, I mean, she just seemed like she had everything she needed to take care for kids. So she started letting her kids go over there all the time. And it was like, like I said, like Lacey had her own daycare. Shauna eventually meets Autumn. Mm-hmm. And Autumn starts referring to John John as hers. So Shauna's like, 
wait, what? <laughs> so then Lacey admits to her, John John's not hers, but kind of in a way of like, well, I never said he was. You know, like, mm. I never told you he was. You just assumed he was because, but whatever. And these kids are young, right? Yeah. Assuming if they're in daycare, they're like not school age kids. They're toddlers. Well, yeah. Okay. So John John was six months old when she started, but right. she watched him over a two year period. I don't know at what point she meets, like Shauna comes into the picture, but it's during that two year period. And yes, McKelly is her youngest. I don't know. Like, I want to say he's like 10 months old. I don't know how old her oldest Zach was, though. It never said. Um. So anyway, also, guess who starts getting ear infections <gasps> once Lacey enters the life? McKelly? McKelly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and I, this is probably not very nice, but you know how at McDonald's they name everything MC something? Mm-hmm. Like McRib, mm-hmm. McFish, all that mm-hmm. stuff. Like McKelly. <laughs> That's what it makes me think of. It's, every time I say it, I feel like I'm going to say McDonald's because <laughs> it's just what wants to come out. But anyway, McNugget. McNugget. Oh, he probably was a little McNugget. Mm. So here we go. I, I, this, I know that this is a lot, <laughs> but I, I promise you we're getting somewhere. Okay. In 2007, the daycare closes down and Lacey is just watching John John McKelly and Zach in her two-bedroom apartment. So now essentially she does just have a daycare. Shauna and her become pretty close friends and Lacey starts sharing stories with her of her abuse from earlier in life of her, from her relatives and starts to really lean on Shauna like a friend, but almost too much. She then tells her that she had a fiance named Blake who died in a car accident. Oh, she found it odd because she had never mentioned her him before and also does not see any pictures of him around. So she figured like, well, if you had a fiance, and he's passed. Like, I assume that I would have seen something, some evidence of him. Mm-hmm. But whatever. Maybe it was too, maybe it hurt too much to see him. But she's like, I'm not going to, so I'm not going to accuse her of lying. So it's fine. Lacey starts to call her at all hours of the night to talk with her. And it just gets to be a little bit too much for Shauna. Mm-hmm. And then one day, Lacey comes to her and tells her that she's pregnant and that the father of the child is a relative. So she's, Going back to the sexual abuse. Of- oh my gosh, she was saying she was still being abused, mm-hmm. like as an adult. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I didn't realize that because at first I just thought her she was telling her the stories from the past, but then she comes up saying she's pregnant, and the relative is the father, but I don't know who she's saying it is. Okay, okay. Shauna's mom is kind of like, all right. This all seems very strange. I need to meet this lady, kind of get a good impression of her. When she finally does, she's pretty suspicious of her and ends up having somewhat of an intervention with Shauna to talk her out of like, or to talk her into cutting Lacey out. Like you, you need to not let the kids go over there all the time. You need to spend less time with her, like be a friend, but like cut her out right. for a little bit. Start, start making and, some distance here. Yeah, because it's even affecting her marriage because they're constantly together. Lacey's like needing her all the time. The kids are always over there. And so even the husband like is in on this intervention. And so she's like, you're right. This this is too much. This is crazy. Let's do this. So they basically like call her over one day and are like, Lacey, you need to give us the key to our house. Like we need to have some distance and space between us. Imagine if my husband or your husband did an intervention, like you need to cut Beth out. It's too much. The texting is too much. (laughs) It could happen. That could actually happen. It really could. (laughs) It could. Oh man. Shh. Don't talk of such blasphemy. Um, Okay. So Lacey gets really mad when clearly she's very emotional about this, yells at her and storms out. And they don't really communicate much after that, except through Facebook every now and then they'll like, you know, maybe comment on a picture. So at some point, Facebook is integrated into this story. It was MySpace, 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 but now Facebook. Okay. Shows the evolution. Yeah. The evolution and Twitter also. Oh. So Lacey decides she's going to go visit her grandmother in Florida for a bit. And when she comes home, she says she has lost the baby and buried it in Florida. So Shauna now is like, I don't even know if she was ever pregnant at all. Right. It looked like she had a baby bump because she was so skinny and like it started to protrude because she remembers like taking a picture of it at one point when she first showed it to her. But then, I mean, I don't know. Can you like. It was the hot dog. So 
Well, I was going to say, like, can you, like, drink so much one day to, like, kind of – I mean, I know I can. Mine definitely patches <laughs> out when I, like, go on a binge of some sort. <laughs> right. It's also a um, – it's a thing that happens if people truly – women truly believe that they're pregnant, they can actually start to experience symptoms that mimic pregnancy. So – Oh, well, that's true. It's too. a real thing psychologically. Okay. Well, maybe that is the case. Or maybe she was pregnant. I don't think so. But – and Shauna does – isn't sure. Okay. So after returning from Florida, Lacey is still watching John John at this point, but Shauna has kind of like backed off. She comes and goes with him and there's this man named Chris Hill that lives underneath her apartment because she lives in an apartment with her sister. He's a garage door, 29-year-old garage door installer. Um, He sees her coming and going all the time and he and his friends like kind of sit around and like have drinks every now and then. They kind of like make fun of how strange she is. You know, like she keeps to herself. She seems cold and distance. Like they just kind of think she's a little weird. But one day Lacey comes down and asks Chris to help her put a crib together that she's just gotten for John John. So he's like, all right, sure. I'll, you know, come help you. So they start talking, kind of become some, I don't want to say friends, but just like they're they're cordial to each other. But then all of a sudden this turns into a neighbor with benefits type situation. <laughs> a neighbor with benefits, okay? Yes, that's how he, I think he described it in the book, so that's how I'm saying it cuz and that's why I don't think that they were necessarily friends cuz I feel like he would have said friends with benefits, yeah. not just neighbors with benefits. So, anyway, in March of 2008, Lacey's 21 years old and now and tells Chris that she's pregnant. The two start talking about the future and about moving in together or possibly even getting married. But Lacey quickly takes a turn and no longer wants to have anything to do with Chris. She's like, you're not the father of the baby. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Blah, 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 blah. And he's just like, what? What? I'm not the father. What do you mean? Anyway, so he's just like, okay, fine. Lacey sticks to this for the remainder of the pregnancy and doesn't talk to Chris and avoids him at all costs. Is she for and real pregnant? For real. She's for real oh, pregnant. Oh, it's for real. Okay. Yeah, it is for real. On December 3rd, 2008, Garnet Paul Thompson Spears. <laughs> it's a big long name. Garnet Paul. He has four names. Yeah. That is so Southern. Oh, is it? Oh, my gosh. It's so Southern. I don't know where all of those names came from, though. Garnet Paul Thompson Spears. Anyway. He's born and he's weighs six pounds, 14 ounces. And after two days, they are discharged and Lacey takes him home. Chris never meets the baby. He would see Lacey come and go, carrying him in the carrier or just holding him. And he would get glimpses of him like through the window, but never met him because she kept threatening to go to the cops if he didn't leave them alone. And he was just like, okay, like, I don't want to upset you. I'll just, you know, leave you be. So. Okay. Also, let me mention here that Im- immediately upon his birth, Lacey is posting pictures on MySpace. <laughs> oh, she hasn't moved on to Facebook. Okay. <laughs> I mean, she is, but I guess she's not really like fully moved over yet. But she, she is on there. But introducing Garnet to the world. But let you let me remind you, she's still watching John John, and so the post will be pictures of both of them together and then calling them big bro and little bro Mm. in her captions and calling them her world and dressing them identically. So she's portraying to the world that these children are both hers. Okay. What I'm not doing a really good job of to this point right now is getting across how much she posts on social media. Okay. It's nonstop. It's literally like when you, If uh, whoever reads this book, you will see literally nonstop posting pictures of these kids and her life and how great it is and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, because she needs the attention. She wants Mm -hmm. attention. She's used to telling stories and getting attention. Well, you can get a whole lot of attention on social media. Right. I mean, people comment, you know, likes, blah, blah, blah. So when Garnet is four days old, she brings him to the hospital because he has a fever. He's jaundiced and he's pulling on his ears. Four days? Four days old. They run tests, can find nothing wrong with him. So they send him home. On December 26th, she brings him again. Again, they find nothing wrong with him and send him home. In January of 2009, she starts bringing him daily, stating he won't eat, he'll vomit everything up, and he's bleeding from his ears. 
Have you ever had your child bleed from their ears? No. Yeah, I haven't either. I was wondering if that was a thing. On January 13th, 2009, a doctor that would treat Garnet made a note in the chart that he believed Lacey was suffering from Munchausen by yeah, proxy that's syndrome. that's literally exactly what I was just going to say. It's not called that anymore. Oh, is it not? No. I mean, it's called that throughout this entire case because that's, I guess at the time, that's what it was, but I don't... It is you know what now it's called, called now? factitious disorder. Oh, I did see that in the book. Mm-hmm. So they did talk about, and maybe they said now it's called and... Yeah, it's now called factitious disorder. Okay. Yeah, because what the heck does Munchausen mean? <laughs> it's the person. <laughs> it was the doctor. <laughs> His name. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Who originally, okay. like, developed the diagnosis. Okay. Okay. All right. So, because clearly she keeps bringing him in. They keep finding nothing wrong. So, it's like she's just like, he's going doing this. He's doing this. And they're like, he's probably not because there's nothing wrong with him. So the next day, someone from the Parental Assistance Agency to Prevent Child Abuse comes to talk to Lacey. So he made that note and clearly called, but this is like the agency that comes to intervene. Like, okay, she needs help being a parent. So let's bring in the help to hopefully avoid any kind of child abuse that might occur because she needs help. So they make a plan to meet and provide her with help and learning how to take care of Garnet. And this person observed that Lacey wasn't too concerned with Garnet at the time of her visit. And then all of a sudden, Lacey started ignoring all of her calls and their appointments, and eventually the investigation and assistance just stopped. Right. That's a great idea. Good plan. Exactly. Yeah. Just, yeah, well, she's not answering Mm -hmm. us, so let's just not go out anymore. Oh, this baby. Oh, no. Three weeks into January, and Lacey brings Garnet to a different hospital where he is diagnosed with reflux, and they perform a small surgery. I don't know what it is, because I didn't know you perform surgery for reflux, but I don't know what it is because I never said Lacey proudly posting pictures of recovering Garnet on MySpace. Hmm. February of 2009, Lacey brought him to a gastroenterologist who diagnosed him with reflux and also failure to thrive due to all the vomiting. And this doctor performs a surgery that basically closes off the esophagus from the stomach, making it impossible for you to vomit anymore. That sounds awful. Right? Right? Yeah. So... He has this surgery. Not long after this surgery, she brings him back to the hospital stating he won't take the formula. The doctor tries to feed him, so and he won't take it, so they insert a nasal feeding tube. Oh, my gosh. Which Lacey takes pictures of and posts on MySpace. Huh. Says, Let's get some attention. My child needs a nasal feeding tube. Oh, no, look how sad he looks. A couple of days later, she comes back to the hospital saying he won't eat again. This time, the doctor is able to get him to take the formula, but not long after he's fed, he becomes lethargic. They run all kinds of tests and finds his sodium levels are way high. They are at a 180 level, which I don't know. It's like a, it doesn't say like milligrams or whatever. Like, I don't know what the, yeah, what the term is, but it's at 100, the level is 180. A level of 155 to 60 is high enough to cause death. Whoa. And he's a baby. And he's 180. Yeah. So this is clearly is a concern and there's no medical reason for it to be this high. So nine week, nine week old Garnet started having seizures and stops breathing. He's airlifted to Children's Hospital in Birmingham And they're able to hydrate him and lower his levels by using a spinal tap to administer IV fluids. And they were concerned about brain damage. But after a few days of treatment, he seems to be getting better. But the entire thing is documented on my Oh, my gosh. Awful pictures of Garnet and all. In in his worst state. I will say, I, I don't think, clearly, I do not think any of this is up there anymore. I didn't even attempt to look for it because I didn't care if it was up there. I do not want to see these pictures. But the people who did see these pictures that were friends of hers, like in through this book and articles, are talking about how awful it was. Like, why would you post pictures of your child in that state? Mm-hmm. Anyway, February 13th, he's released from PICU and goes to the general floor where he stayed for the next 11 days. A gastroenterologist was sent in to evaluate him to find out why he was having such issues with feeding, but she couldn't find any issues because there weren't any. Garnet was eating just fine for her. He'd take the bottle, was holding it down, wasn't gagging, nothing. 
everything, every test that they gave him came out normal. They couldn't find any physiological reason or genetic reason for any of the stuff that Lacey says he does. So they decide we're going to quarantine Garnet from Lacey for a few days. Thank you. So they do. They do this for four days. He ate normally the entire time. However, I bet she threw a fit. Oh, yeah. She was not happy about that. But she had a lot of things on on my space. Oh, I'm sure. They end up releasing him from the hospital the end of February. So what? I am so confused as to why they did this. Found out that he was totally fine for those days. Confirmed it. Had a suspicion and confirmed it. Why they release him to her? I have no idea. I have no idea. Oh, my. So in the spring... Because when was this? February. Yeah. So in February, he's released the end of February. In the spring, so a couple of months later, Garnet started to go back to the hospital for chronic ear infections. So she wasn't bringing him in for the stomach stuff anymore. Now it's ear infection. I do again. not get this ear infection thing. I don't either. I would really love to find out like how you cause pus in the ear. I I, I don't know. That seemed like a, a terrible sentence for me to say. <laughs> just was thinking the same thing. I like made a face. Like, ooh. I really, but I just want to know, like, how do you do that? Like, how was she doing this? I don't know. But clearly she was. So no matter what they did, the, how they treated it, nothing ever got better because it wasn't an infection. So mm-hmm. what, however you treat an ear infection, it's not getting better. Right. But you do know like swimmer's ear is like an ear infection. So unless it was like that, we're like just she was putting constant water in there and oh. it was just getting so bad. That could be. Because I know like my son gets really bad swimmers ear infections and that's treated differently. It's not an antibiotic thing. Yeah, it's like, drop, probably, like drops in their ears and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And it relieves the pressure. And and maybe they're not thinking that is the cause because he's nine weeks old and why would he be swimming so much <laughs> that right. swimmers ear or like have water. Anyways, I don't know. I don't know. But how you can't tell the difference, I have no idea. So that summer, Garnet was brought back in for the vomiting again. And I don't know if you're making a face at this, but I'm making a face at vomiting because didn't he have surgery he to prevent it. from vomiting? Okay, but I guess they don't know this because he brought him, like, she's brought him to so many doctors and she doesn't give medical oh, records to everybody. Gosh. What so she mess. can tell whoever the hell she wants that he's vomiting and he's really not, though. So, anyway, so the nurses try and ask, you know, how are you feeding him? Like, you need to feed him slowly, sit him upright, you know, like all the things that when my kid did have reflux, they're like, you need to do these things because he's bringing it back up. So you have to keep him upright for a certain amount of time, blah, 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 slowly feed him. So they're telling him all this stuff because when they fed him, he ate just fine and he wouldn't vomit for them. Well, when he can't, but he did just fine, but she keeps bringing him in. So one time he's admitted because they were all concerned and Lacey comes running out. So he's admitted and, and they're like, clearly something's going on. So let's admit him and keep an eye on him. Even if we're just keeping an eye on her, but so he's in the room. So she comes running out and is like, he's vomited all over the bed. I told you, blah, blah, blah. But when the nurse goes in, it's not vomit. It's like, it's just water. Like she poured water on the bed and the nurse is like, that's just water. Like. You, what are you trying? Have you tried a kid here? And Lacey's like, whoa. whoa. Oh anyway. my gosh. Yes. Yes. So another time she brings him in and he's bleeding from his nose, eyes, mouth, and ears. How does that happen? Ebola. What? <laughs> I mean, that's the only thing I know of. I mean, none of that was mentioned. This is just that those, that's what's said. He's bleeding from his no- nose, eyes, mouth, and ears and has to be airlifted again. And when they sent him on the um, helicopter, they send to the DHR, that Department of Human Resources, that like message, child being airlifted, blah, blah, blah. This is what happens. But no investigation happens after that because none of the doctors filed a report after that. Like that message was sent and apparently it's just a courtesy message, but then a report has to be filed by one of the doctors who cared for him in order for them to investigate. Wow. So, you know, it's okay just to say kids bleeding from, but the doctor doesn't send something. So no case was ever opened. Oh my goodness. Lacey kept bringing him back for feeding issues and wanted a G-tube to be placed in, but he was always eating just fine when he went to the hospital. So they were refusing. They're like, we're not doing this because he can clearly eat. So we don't know what's going on, but he know he can eat and we're not putting a G-tube in unless it's absolutely necessary. So she brings him somewhere else who then performs the surgery and places a G-tube in his stomach. Again, 
all of this is documented. Oh my gosh. Oh, here's where she gets a Twitter handle and changes over to Facebook. Okay. <laughs> but in my notes. So then all these posts go out and she's great. Her life is there and for everyone to see. Oh no, poor Garnet. Now everything's bad. Oh, but now we're great. Oh, you know, back and forth. And meanwhile, she's this amazing mother taking care of this kid who has all of these medical needs and oh, you're the best mom ever. He's so lucky to have you. Ugh. Ding, 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 ding. She's a single mom with a special needs baby. That's what the Facebook and Twitter and MySpace world know. Garnet, his first year of life, hospital visits, 23 of them. Wow. 20, 23. I thought it would have been more after all that stuff, but 23 visits his first year of life. Just before he turns two, Lacey decides to go visit with her grandmother in Clearwater. Also, here's now. I, I'm going to have to add this again because I want to remind you guys of Blake. Lacey is telling everyone Blake is the dad. Oh, Blake, the ex fiance that died in a crash. A police officer who was killed in a car accident when Garnet was two years old. So this is around the time where Blake dies in the car crash. Well, she is something. However, she had already told somebody about Blake and that he had died in a car crash like two years before. Mm -hmm. which she told Autumn or Shauna, which before she even had a baby. But now he died in this car crash when Blake or Garnet's too. And she posts about it all the time yeah. on the anniversary, like drawn out posts about how much she misses him and how she can't believe she has to do this without him. And blah, blah, blah. so you can imagine the attention she's getting for that. This poor single woman who's got a special needs baby and her uh, uh, fiance died in a car crash. She posts pictures of him as well. But oh my someone, gosh. Someone in her like school from her school days Starts to notice that it's basically the same picture she's posting all the time. And it's like she Googles and is like, it's just like a stock photo of him. Like that had been like, maybe he was in the newspaper or like somehow whatever that she got offline and just keeps posting the same one, but she'll crop it in ways that'll make it look like it's a different picture. So she'll zoom in on his face or like crop it a different way. Like, I don't know. It's really strange, but somebody puts it together that this is basically like one, maybe one or two pictures that she posts that are exactly the same all the time. Okay. She's milking this too. So there is just, I know I've already shared, I've shared 45 minutes of stuff, right? And we haven't even gotten to the true meat of it. Oh no. <laughs> this is the first, what I told you was in the first quarter of that book. This is the book. I'm going to show it to you right now. This, this is, is just her background. This is this is how much I read. I'm wow. showing Beth. Oh my gosh. Of the book. And I got all of that from that. Whew. So you can imagine like what the rest of this is. Like I can't I couldn't. I couldn't do it anymore. So, but like I said, I would be like basically reading you this book if I wanted to if I needed to give you every detail and I just can't. And so until this point, I felt like I needed to get the point across of something's really wrong here. Like you needed to hear all of those things to really grasp that she is she's awful. She has some so now, real issues. She has some real issues. So now I'm going to start to condense, but you're going to get the gist of everything. But from now this point on, so he's two. So she goes to visit grandma. Her also lives with uncle. Well, uncle ends up passing away from cancer. So Lacey decides a couple of months later, okay, in early 2011, I'm going to go move in with grandma in Clearwater. So she leaves. But also, sorry, but the heat's starting to get on her where she's living. Mm -hmm. People are really starting to get like – concerned about this. So mm -hmm. she gets the hell out of Dodge, goes to live with grandma. Now, when I tell you I got to some parts in the book, they were talking about doctors that I know. Oh, because it was, was in Florida? Me. Yeah. It was in Pinellas County, the same county I lived in. And because he was had ear stuff, one of the um, ENTs in here that's mentioned in here that she brought him to is a doctor that was very well known in that field. Wow. Back when I was working there. I think he's passed away. Like he had a heart attack running or something like that. So he's but and he didn't do anything bad in this either. So, but he's just one of the ones that she, she took him to. So, anyways, she joins parenting groups in Florida. She's making friends. She starts posting about how she'll only feed Garnet organic food now. She's trying to change his diet to see if that's going to help. Blah blah. blah that she's never going to put any poison in his body, like fast food or boxed things. Or <laughs> anyway, oh my gosh, on this, like well. other kinds. Yeah, well. So he's still getting sick though, and consistently still has his ear infections and 
constantly showing up in hospitals as frequently as she was going and just flying under the radar, apparently still on, in Florida now because she just showed up there. So she was, she was starting to get on their radar and now she's under the radar again. So in June of 2012, she finds a holistic doctor to start treating Garnet and totally turns away from Western medicine and slams it on social media. She just like, I will never bring him to another doctor again. I'll no longer give him antibiotics. I'm not doing any of that. And friends and family are, are super concerned because they're like, Garnet's always sick. Mm -hmm. How can you totally turn away from doctors and medicines and stuff like that? But she just slams it on social. She starts hanging out with people in her parenting group. And some send her, some send their kids to this place called Sun Coast Waldorf School. Are you familiar with the Waldorf schools? No. I mean, they're like a big thing, but I don't really know a whole lot about them, but they're like a very niche, niche, whatever kind of group. But in July of 2012, she starts nannying for a family in Palm Harbor. The mother of the children is quite familiar with the Waldorf Dorf schools. She doesn't send her kids there, but she knows a lot about them and supports them. And Lacey starts talking to her about them. Um, and so while working for them, Lacey starts doing research and finds the Fellowship Community in Chest Ridge, New York. And this is a unique compound where they have 140 acres and they have a Sunbridge Center, which is a Waldorf like educator training facility, a nature food co-op, and something called, oh, a school, also a Waldorf school, and also the fellowship, which is a home for the elderly. So they put a lot of emphasis on community among generations there, and they have a live off of the land philosophy. Mm -hmm. So she starts researching that and is kind of like, oh, I kind of want, that's where I want to go. Because now she's been in Pinellas County for like a couple years. She needs to like Get hmm. off the radar again. Oh my gosh. So she starts to set her eyes on that place and she finds out that if she works for the community, then she'll be given room and board and an education for Garnet. So by the end of July 2012, is that what I said? Yes. I'm going back to my notes. Yes. She um finds she starts applying for membership. She has to fill out all this paperwork, including medical forms, in which she states that she and Garnet have no medical issues at all. Oh, what? Well, I believe that, actually. Well, that's the truth. Yeah. I mean, that's the real truth. And she knows that if she says that, she'll get, like, has a better chance. If she talks about his plethora of issues and how many hospitals she goes to all the time, they're probably be like, no, we don't need that. So, meanwhile, she's still, according to everything else, getting ear he's still getting ear infections and not eating well. But, so, in September of 2012, Garnet goes to the hospital and has a blood, they find a blood disorder somehow. So they give him a blood transfusion and they end up taking his spleen out. How, I don't know how this, she had to have caused this because there, there wasn't anything wrong with this child. Truly. She caused a blood disorder? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Like, I have no, I, I don't know how. I don't know. I'm so confused by <laughs> this whole thing, truly. But somehow there is a blood disorder that is decided on. So he gets a blood transfusion and his spleen is taken out. And when they run other tests, they find that his liver is only working at 75%. So they're like, he needs to stay in the hospital. So he spends a week in the hospital and starts to recover and then releases him. In October, Garnet is again in the hospital getting a blood transfusion and doctors voice their concerns to the Pinellas County Sheriff. Clearly, she's already in the works of getting the hell out of Pinellas County. So they get involved and start an investigation. Lacey always cancels the interviews that are set up and then the department with them and the Department of Children and Family Services. But in the meantime, she's meeting with members of the Suncoast Waldorf School. They like her, so they ask her to join. And because she's now in with the one in Florida, within three months, she's moving to New York to join that New York campus that she wants to work for. And she's out of the grasp of authorities once again. Wow. She moves... Yes. In November of 2012, she moved there. She works for the fellowship for about six months. People like her, but some are cautious. They say she's super sweet one minute, but will turn on you in like a quick second. She's a like, liar. Liar, she's a liar. Liar. Pants on fire. Mm -hmm. And she also, they some people say they think that she tried to pit people against each other, like somehow. Do you hear my dog? I'm sorry. That was the dog? <laughs> that was a dog. I didn't know what like, that was. Scratching her ear, and she's like, oh, oh that feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, so in April of 2013, she accuses a man of sexual advances. 
nothing comes of this accusation. And so there's not a whole lot written about it. So I don't know if it's just like proven right away that it wasn't true or what, but nothing comes of it. But then in October, she accuses another man and he and his wife just leave the fellowship. And it's kind of stated that they left because they just didn't want to deal with it. Like mm-hmm. that they weren't admitting any guilt. He was never found to have committed any of this. They were just like, you know what? Maybe they had seen that she's such a troublemaker. They're like, let's just get out of here. We can't huh. like we can't do this. So they leave. So now. Now? Here's here's, <laughs> here's where the here's where the horrible stuff comes. Oh okay? my. If you gosh. Where I know where it's already been horrible. Okay. Lacey posts on January eleventh, two thousand fourteen, a picture of her, Garnet, with her and Garnet with pancakes. And a caption of breakfast by candlelight. Things are great. Garnet's great. She had posted a couple days earlier, his first day of school, or a couple months earlier, his first day of school. Like things are really going well right now. Is he five? He just is turning five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he just turned five in December. Okay. Yeah. The posts over the next 11 days, though, are a complete downward spiral for Garnet and his health. He gets the flu. So she brings him in to the doctor. He starts having seizures. And then he's also on and off breathing tubes. Oh, no. All of this is documented on social media with pictures, gruesome pictures. Lacey brings him to the hospital. So here's it. So, okay. Brings him to the hospital. Testing is done. They find nothing wrong with him. He would get better and then get worse. They couldn't explain it. Lacey would be by his side the entire time in the hospital. He was admitted for that seizure-like activity because they did see somewhat of a seizure-like activity when he was there at one point. They set him up with an EEG, which I don't know if you know what that is, but basically you wear a cap mm-hmm. on your head and it monitors your brain activity to like monitor that seizure. Well, this comes with a video feed. So you have to sign a release and it likes they set up a camera because they're also watching, like videoing uh-huh. his activity too, besides okay. just the cap. And I watched this video. You did? Well, not the entire thing, because I don't think the entire thing is out there, but I have watched multiple parts of it. Okay, okay. This shows Lacey in bed with him, playing around with him. At one point, there's like a nurse blowing up one of the gloves, and they're playing with him. And he's like this happy-go-lucky kid a majority of the time. Lacey takes him. You see Lacey take him to the bathroom every now and then. He would start to get better. And then within a few days, he's pretty much doing great. They don't notice and They don't have any seizure activity being recorded. So they're like, okay, well, we think he can go home tomorrow. Like everything's great. So Lacey, not long after that, takes him into the bathroom to go to the bathroom. Within minutes of coming out of the bathroom, he takes a turn for the worse and is has stomach pain. Like you literally see her take him to the bathroom, come out. And within minutes, he's on the bed, retching in pain. He's screaming. His head hurts. He's trying to throw up, but he can't throw up because he is unable to. And all of a sudden, he codes. And they (gasps) call a code. And he's unresponsive. Oh, my gosh. You just scared the crap out of me. I'm sorry. I'm so upset. It's okay. (laughs) No, I Trust me. I know. He's unresponsive and not breathing. They run tests, and his sodium level is 182. And when he came to the hospital, it was 138. So... While he's in the hospital, his sodium is going up, and they have no idea how this is happening because there's no medical reason for it to happen. So they airlift him again to that children's hospital where they airlifted him the first time. Or no, no, this, I'm sorry, this is a different state. They airlift him to another children's hospital, (laughs) treat him with IVs, and within a day, his levels come down and he starts to improve. But that only lasts for about 24 hours because so much damage has already happened and his brain had begun to swell from the sodium levels. And two days after being at the children's hospital, he is pronounced brain dead and is on life support. And on January 23rd, Lacey makes a decision to take him off. And we don't have to, I don't have to remind you how she's documenting all of this. Oh my gosh. This poor baby, this poor baby. When do not try and watch that video. You legitimately see him die, essentially. Like, because once he coded, he in that hospital, and then they, like he was gone at that point. Police start to investigate. They go to her home and they see all the medications that Garnet is on, and in front, like on the table, 
And in front of all of them is a container of sea salt. So they see all these bags of formula for feeding, but they kind of leave those. Ten weeks after his death, though, the coroner rules it a homicide. (sighs) A friend from the fellowship calls the police at this point and informs them that while Lacey was in the hospital, she called her and asked her to remove the feeding bag that was hanging on the thing from her apartment and to get rid of it and not to tell anybody. So whatever the feeding bag that was like hanging, the last one that had been used to feed him, she told her to get rid of it. So she goes and takes it out, but doesn't get rid of it because she's kind of like, I don't know, I don't feel right about this, but she's good friends with Lacey. So she's kind of like on this fence. But she ends up calling the police when she finds out that it's a homicide, I guess. and Or no, she told the fellowship and the fellowship took it and called. Okay. So the police go and get it and also go back to her house to go get those other ones that they had seen in the trash and whatever and take took those. When they test it, they discover that each one of the bags they had contained sodium amounts equivalent to 69 packets of salt. Each one of those feeding t- bags had that much salt in it. Oh my, gross. So she basically killed her son with salt. She was poisoning him with salt? Salt. Mm -hmm. He died because of the sodium intake in his system. That's what caused his death. They believed that they needed more than this, though, to make a case because obviously there was a chain of custody issue. Oh. She took it out, then she gave it to the fellowship, and they had already gone but didn't take the bag, so they don't know if anybody else had gone into the place. But since then, you know, like, there was this chain of custody thing. So they were like, well, we can't really for sure get her on this, so we've got to keep looking. So then they find out about the video feed that's on, loc- on this EEG. So they decide to watch it. And they watch Lacey take Garnet to the bathroom several times throughout it. And each time that happened is when he would get worse. Mm -hmm. They saw that as she walked in with him, that she would have a cup and a part of his feeding tube in her hand with, with her. And then in the final bathroom trip was just before he coded. She also had the feeding tube, like tube in her hand, like she was going to attach it and do something. I don't know. Also in the footage, they saw Lacey laying in the bed with Garnet, and at one point she was on her phone. So they get her phone, and they check it, and they match up the time that's on the video feed to what she was searching at that time Okay, on her phone. And, excuse me, she's looking up the effects of high sodium levels, dangers of high sodium levels, and signs of high sodium is what she is Googling. And this was before they realized he had high sodium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it was that last bathroom. So this is all that last the last bathroom trip because he had they already tested his high sodium or his sodium levels when he was admitted, and he was at one thirty eight, and then he would like get bad, but then get better. So I guess they didn't test him until he then coded, mm-hmm. and then they tested it again. So they put a warrant out for her arrest, and oh, I forgot to mention that after he passed, and they had a service for him, she. Um, went and lived with her parents in Kentucky because they were now living in Kentucky. I don't know when they moved, whatever. But when she finds out that there's a warrant for her arrest, she flies back to New York and turns herself in. Five months after his death, Lacey is charged with murder in the second degree and first degree manslaughter. Her trial starts in February of 2015. Her attorneys make the claim that the hospital changed his diet, which exacerbated such a hard word, his stomach issues. They didn't give him the necessary medications to combat that dehydration or the dehydration he had. And then they made the dehydration worse by giving him rapid infusions with IV solution, which had sodium in it. So they're saying that the people who were trying to save his life were the people that killed him. Oh, go ahead. It doesn't explain the formula bags. No, it doesn't. But... Again, there's a chain of custody custody issue with that. However, it is definitely admit, like brought into evidence. They definitely use it for for the um, trial. But yeah, and there's not a, there's not that much sodium in those IV bags. Clearly, they're not killing everyone by using them. No. Like I've had you know plenty of IV bags in my day. Yeah, 
So don't say that. The, anyways. Okay. So also during the trial, it has this Munchausen by proxy, which was the term at the time, mm -hmm. was brought up multiple times, like before and everything. But she is so like, no, I did not do this to my kid. I didn't do it. I don't have any mental illness. I don't have this. I don't want anybody to mention it. So she like makes her attorneys promise not, not to even bring it up. The prosecution apparently is not allowed to bring it up either or whatever. But anyways, nobody's allowed to bring this up. The trial lasts three weeks and the jury deliberates for two and a half days and come back with a verdict of guilty, guilty of depraved indifference of the murder of a child. Wow. That sounds and gnarly. I was going to say, you know what it means? Because I didn't know. I mean, I know what all those words mean, <laughs> but basically it means like she basically killed somebody and did not even care that she was doing it, like could care less of what she was doing. So in April of 2015, she was sentenced to 20 years to life. The defense wanted the judge to show leniency because the maximum sentence of this was 25 years to life. And so the defense, when they were, I watched her whole 30 minute um, sentencing video and they were like constantly like saying, you should show leniency. We should, we think it should be 15 to life. Blah, 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 blah. Clearly the prosecution wanted 25 to life. The judge ultimately told her that she clearly had a mental illness of Munchausen by proxy. 100. And I'm pretty sure he said that on purpose because of the like, don't say this word mm -hmm. <laughs> and don't mm -hmm. say I have it. And hoped that she would be willing to receive the help that she needed at some point. And then I'm. this is a quote that I pulled off of one of the articles. He said, by not imposing the maximum sentence, I'm combining punishment with something that you did not exhibit towards your own son, namely mercy. So he's like, I'm only giving you 20. So I'm showing you some mercy that you don't know how to show. Anyways, during this tri the sentencing, the defense was also like mentioning all these things they wanted to strike from the like court records, like words like before he went to code, Lacey brought him to the bathroom, blah, 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 blah. Like they were like, take that word before out because she was doing it the whole time he was in the hospital. <laughs> like, like they were like nitpicking about little things because they didn't want it to say that when they put their appeal in. Oh, I was going to say, what's the point? But oh, okay. They said at the end, because that's what the judge was like, why? I am so tired of you guys basically nitpicking this. Like what? And they were like, we want it to be fully like in good order before we put our appeal in. They knew they were going to lose from the beginning. I guess so. So they immediately put the appeal in. Her appeal is denied December of 2016. I haven't seen anything about it since. And she's still insisting that she's innocent and does not even consider a mental illness. And she will be eligible for parole in 2034 at the age of 46. Wow. 46. That's so young. She could have other kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope she doesn't get parole because if she's refusing to get help the whole time, maybe they'll be like, eh. She's not admitting her guilt. Wow. Is that the end? That's it. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. Wow. I would And I'm not sorry. Go ahead. I would not have done that case. I have to, Alyssa. I see why you sent it mm -hmm. to Christy because nay nay. For me. Well, do you see why it took me so long to like get to it? Because I knew I was going to have to really, 100%. really do this. And and like I said, there's so many more details in this. Like I towards like I gave a lot of details in the beginning just to get the point across that Lacey's some whacked up piece of garbage. But then it was like, okay, let's let's get through this. Like I can't, I can't. I, she I, tortured I can't. children. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, she did. She tortured him his entire life. And that's what the and defense other uh, children. The said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now they weren't brought in to the trial, I will say. Right. That I saw. I didn't I didn't see the whole trial, but when they were talking, when they I, I was listening to the prosecution on the um sentencing trial, um they didn't mention any of that. But basically they were like, this little boy was tortured his entire life. His whole life like, he was so sick. His whole life. Mm -hmm. it's so By cute his too. mother. Mm -hmm. oh, rest in peace, baby. I know. Yes, hopefully he is now resting in peace. Oh, I hope they don't let her out. Oh my gosh. Wow. That was crazy. Good job. 
I well, don't know if it was or not, but you know, it's done. Your last couple cases have been tough. Mm-hmm. Well, that's because they've been ki- – well, last one before was a kid. I don't know if the one before that was, but <sighs> – Rough cases. You guys are going to make her quit her job. <laughs> These are hard. Maybe that's why I have a headache today. <laughs> I guarantee you. You have to get all that evil out of your brain, mm-hmm. and it's out now. Can I sage my brain? Can you sage your brain? Yeah, I think so. I don't really know. Don't don't put anything in your ear, please. No, I'm not. <laughs> Wow. Okay. I'm not going to keep you guys much longer. That was an insane case. Insane. Mm-hmm. So well done. And so sad and awful. Thanks for the suggestion, Alyssa. Um, stay tuned for the book giveaway. We'll post mm-hmm. something about that soon. So you got to come find us on social media. If you like what you hear, come find us on Patreon. We'd love to have you there. We appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for listening. And always remember the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet.